Excuse Jericho because he was so nervous when Tom mm. said to me sing that song and mm. he like we normally don't normally we don't practice and so well he did his best. Um this is a new song so I want everyone to really take this in and Thank God that He has called us to be who we are right now. Yes. Oh, 
floor for anyone to do good things. a bit shy singing that so be there on my vision. I, I felt him you know, carrying me down and helping me focus and trying to push through that song and I felt his comfort and his presence here today. So I just want to be here. Yeah. Yeah. taking the monitor so I'm gladly giving the monitor because he could bring it back <laughs> you know? so he could have been but no it's not the material things it's the heart that counts so I want to thank God for mm. his for some sort of his right? so. mm. There's two, two specific stories that I just wanted to quickly share, which um, it's, it's, it, it was just so amazing for me. Um, I went to go and <clears throat> meet up with Emma's mom the one day uh, to go uh, fetch something for Emma, and uh, that she was sending, that Rachel was sending over to this side. And actually because I, I'm not always good with directions, but I know generally in which direction I'm supposed to go. Uh, so even with the GPS, I took the wrong turn, but then I just parked because I was so close and turning around was just going to take forever. So just parked the car and then I walked past one restaurant that sort of caught my eye and I, and I met Rachel, just chatted with her and then started on my way back. And because of a internal joke in the family about cats and stuff, but that's a for another day, um, I actually saw the one guy who was a waiter in the restaurant that I was on my way walking back to the car. He had this thing said, now, it's now or never. And then I just knocked on the window and I said, yeah, that's cool, that's cool. And I called him over and said, listen, I just need to take a picture for my daughter. She'll, she'll get it. 
And um, this guy was from Zimbabwe, he's 25 years old, we start chatting. Now I need to take one step back. That morning, I was at a ministry in Cape Town because I was looking for certain resources, certain material, and they were actually giving away a lot of stuff that I was actually interested in. And one of the books that I received for free was a book about the four main religions in the world, explaining what it is and how Christianity, why Christianity is literally the only way. Um, so bearing that in mind, I have this book with me in the car. So I started talking to this guy, his name is Clyde. So I have a coffee, sat down, I wasn't busy in the restaurant at that stage, it was like 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And we started chatting, and he basically said to me that um, he believes that, that you know, all the religions are pretty much the same. And um, there is some type of a creator, but he's not sure, but, and him and his friends, they talk about it often. So I started talking to him about uh, things about God, and I, shot, and I shared the gospel with him, and his eyes just lit up when he actually, when this started sinking into him. And I said to him, listen, I have a book with me that I wanted to take back to Ireland, and I wanted to actually give it to you. And he was blown away by the fact that I, I even had that. So I gave that as a gift to him, and I gave him some other things just to read. And then um, a week ago, I just followed up with him how that went. But this is like, uh, there's about a, let's say a week gap between I spoke to him last. And then he said, he just told me that he's full on following Christ now. And it was, so, it was so awesome to see that message. And um, so, yeah, so that's, that's Clyde. So please just pray for Clyde from Cape Town, 25-year-old, um, just found Christ. So God, God turned to Christ. So that's the one story. The other one, I'll be quick. Um, is, uh, <laughs> um, there was, uh, I was visiting my parents, and my parents was sharing a house, was staying with a lady that um, has two carers that sort of tag teams and they, they with her 24 hours a day. And one of the carers, she's 21 years old, just recently turned 21. And um, there's telltale signs, she didn't share me her life story or anything like that, but I just spoke to her a few times, but there's signs that she had a very, very hard life. And, um, and then I asked her one day if she believed in God, and she said no. And I asked her why, she said it's just because of all the evil and the bad things that she sees in the world. She said, how can there be a God? And so she obviously takes it from the perspective of the things that have happened to her and maybe other people. And um, so I also shared the gospel with her. And the other day I asked her, I sent her a message again, I asked her how she was, and I, and I gave her the whole gospel of John to read. And she said she will read it. And, um, and I asked her how she's doing, and then I asked her, will you go to heaven if you die today? She said yes. I said, why? Because he died for my sins. So, <laughs> so awesome. And so I just praise God for those opportunities and those people. And uh, I pray that God will just be with them and guide them, that they will grow in faith with them. So, Amen. Yeah. Amen. We're blessed with some Amen. Just want to thank God this evening, especially for our nation, Ireland, uh, for those of us that are immigrants here. Ireland has been a blessing to all of us and to our children in terms of education, you know, integration and all of that. And the Bible teaches us to pray for our leaders. And this morning I want to thank God for the leaders of the Republic of Ireland, you know, for helping them to make the right decisions and the right policies. so nice to see. I think this could be the day or one of the days or maybe first time 
seeing Tom and Sam so relaxed, sitting back and sharing their love when Tom putting a hand around Sam, you know. So, yeah, I want to thank God for their service and it's nice to take a step back and relax. Yeah, amen. Good morning, everybody. Okay, Lola Padraig, son of Dave, from St. Patrick's Day. And um, I'm just going to read from 1 Kings 17, verses 7 and following. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Go at once to Sarabak in the region of Sidian and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Sarfa. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, And bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, Don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first, make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me, and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah told her, so there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. As you know, we're kind of, I'm kind of do like a five minute blurb um, every Sunday. And I think what's very important about this is that there's obedience on both parts from Elijah listen to the word of what God has told them and go. I'm sure it was very hard for him to go to a somebody who, after speaking to, said, I'm going to die. The last bit of food I have is for me and my son, and I'm going to die. But yet she, in obedience to what she heard of the prophet, did so. So she made the bread, and I'm sure in her head, because that, if that was me, I'd be going, I hope there's enough, I hope there's enough, I hope there's enough. And she did what was asked, and there was enough for everybody. And it lasted three and a half years throughout the drought. If she did not do that, she would have died that day. The whole, and I can testify to this. Um, I remember one time, um, it happened more than once, but one particular, um, I was cooking dinner, and Tom brought home a lot of people. And I only had enough for him, me, and two kids. But he decided to bring home four adults. And four adults, eat a lot more than two kids. And I can testify we had enough to go around for everybody and it fed everybody's satisfaction. And that literally was God. But what I'm trying to say here is that you need to listen to God and be obedient to God. You need to listen to what he is asking you to do. And sometimes he's gonna ask you to do stuff when you have nothing. He's gonna ask you to share something when you have little. Because if you don't share when you have little, how are you gonna share when you have a lot? because you never know that you have a lot. Yeah. So you have to start learning to give when you have small amounts. And I can also testify to that. Um, if you start listening to God and listening and obeying to what he's asking you to do, I, I, like I can even say right now, with the situation we are in, we're after dropping massively in financial. I mean massive, it's like night and day. But I do know this, God is my provider ultimately, Amen. and he will see me through. But he's only sees me through because I started this many years ago. And I've given with little all the way through. So even though it can be fearful at times and you see stuff coming in, if you start doing stuff and start doing it correctly to what God is asking you to do, you will be sure to see what he will do with your great amount. But not only with your great amount, how much you can do with your little amount. If that's where you're at at this point in time. Because he knows where you are. He sees your heart and that's what he's looking for. He's not looking for your finances. He's not looking for you. He's really looking for your heart. And in that, you give your time, your finances and your talent. So if you're obedient in this, you'll be obedient in almost everything else. Amen. 
Lord God, I ask you to bless us. I ask you, Lord God, that you open our ears, that we can hear you clearly, that we can hear you clearly so that we may know what you're asking us to do as individuals, what you're asking us to do as families, so that we can, we can proclaim your word, not through just our mouths, but through our actions and through our deeds, Lord God. And we ask you to bless every family here, not only in their finances, Lord God, but with their peace, and give them wisdom on what they should be doing in their lives and help to follow you. Amen. 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 It's good to see you all this morning, guys. Some people like to say, it's good to see you all this morning, guys. Okay, that's a little bit better, but I still feel, I don't feel the love yet. I don't feel the love yet. It's good to see you this morning, guys. You know, one of the things I'm glad of, uh, I'm glad to be an Irishman. I can tell you that. I, I just want to be straight with you. I'm glad to be an Irishman because I honestly do think there's not many nations that, I'm going to be honest, I think there's not many nations as good as Ireland. I think Ireland is a very good nation. Now, I, I'll be safe, I'll be straight with you. There's some of the laws and some of the things passing that I'm not happy about as things are going on and things are progressing. But still as a nation, there's, there's as a nation, it's a, it's a good nation to be in. It's, you know, you drive down the road, you're not frightened of necessarily being, you know, stopped in the middle of the road and hijacked or, you know what I mean? There's lots of good things. You're, Generally speaking, when you're doing business, generally when you're doing business, you expect the other person to fulfill the contract. You know, generally speaking, when you walk down the road, if you bump into somebody, most of the people are polite and say, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you with me? And when you're dealing with business, you're most people. So I'm glad of the nation in that sense. Now, I, I must admit, when I was growing up, I loved the fact that everybody said hi to each other. And sadly, in the cities, it's getting less. In the countryside, it's still high. In the countryside, you still get even the farmer going around the load, you know, you just get the finger up. You know, just hi. That slight nod. Oh, man, you gotta realize that slight nod is a hello. It's an acknowledgement that you're a person and you're alive. And it can be very slight. It can be, it can be just that. Very slight. But it's a hi. Isn't it? Tim? It's a very much a hi. It's a hello. How are you? And it could be. Get used to that. <laughs> it's just a little bit. Or a little finger going up. And, you know, it's, it's an acknowledgement that you're a person. And I pray that we keep some of that and keep that. And we're going to look at that a little bit more. But I just want to remind you that coming up in notices, I just want to remind you that we, on Good Friday night, Farm Week. Easter Sunday, we're going to be trying to launch pub, more publicly Farm Week Church. There's people involved already, but a bit more publicly. But Good Friday night, I really want to encourage you to come along Good Friday night to with your other brothers and sisters from good news around i know some of you might be busy with different stuff friday night some of you might be working but if you can make it if you can get, if you don't have a car or a lift try and get a lift off someone in the church it'd be great to have you there in farnry as we're praying for and having that blessing farnry as we're about to launch a new congregation there yeah. you know you might say i'm not an evangelist well you can come on good friday night can't you that's part of evangelism in a way because even the other people, if there's any visitors, they'd be encouraged by seeing you there worshiping God. And also we kick him back and such the darkness around us as we light the light of Jesus and praise and worship. So I want to encourage you. <laughs> I want to encourage you to come along to Fire and We on Good Friday night and we're going to have communion together and just to have a time of fellowship together. The doors will open at seven, but we'll be kicking off on time at 7.30, but the doors will be open at 7 for, for anybody who just wants to come along and fellowship as we we're, make sure everything's set up. The other notice I have is this, is just to let you know, the, the, the establishment here has got onto us for their own insurance purposes and fire, uh, because the fire, the fire chief was in and stuff like that, fire officer was in, we actually have to, and it's not a bad thing anyway, we actually have to take an account of who's here and who's not here. So. By God's grace, from next Sunday onwards, there will be a, a sign-in sheet keep on passing around. If you've come in, please sign it because there is a book down below. But to be honest with you, I, uh, we want to do it ourselves. We want to have that. And often we used to do that with cards as well, keeping people up to date. So if you're a regular here, what will happen is this is your name will be there. And the first digits of your phone number will be there. And you just tick a box that you're here. 
Yeah. And so we can pass that on to people and say that it's here, but I don't want to be giving them your phone numbers and all that, you know, GDPR and all that crap. Yeah. But uh, just to say that you're here, it's just to do with their fire and their insurance and stuff like that. So we're going to have to start doing that. Uh, before, Sam used to just sign good news at the front desk, and that was enough. But seemingly now they want to know exactly how many, you know, all that kind of crap. And look, it is the way it is. It's a bit of a logistics uh, problem. So we'll probably try and keep the sign in sheet at the back there somewhere. We'll try and see if we can get something there. So when you come in, just take it. And if you're a new person, what will happen is you'll have to actually put your name down and give us your phone number. And then the following week, then it'll be part of the list. So there might be a long list and because your name might be there. I'll try and do it, not necessarily in, in surname. I'm going to try and do it in first name. So alphabetically in first name, okay? Good? Yeah. And that includes teenagers as well, by the way. Well, that's not the way I've done it on the other sheets. It's not the way I've done it on the other sheets. Oh, it's a nightmare. I know, logistics nightmare, Sam. <laughs> this is where Sam gives out to me about different things. Anyway, so with that in mind, if there's kids' church, I right, come here, Kemi. We missed you last week. We missed you. I love some of you are wearing green. Look at me, I'm terrible. I'm an Irishman. I'm not wearing green at all. I am. Oh, look at all you, look at all this, uh, come here, come on, okay, come here, we have to have a little bit of a, a show here. Okay, kids, come on, show me what you've got in your heads. Come on, come on, come on. Yay. Now, I think this, now, we, we everybody wins in, in today's society, but okay, but we're going to do something for fun, just for fun, just for a great minute. Okay. Now, adults, if you want to do it, you can. Who thinks this is cute? Yay! Who thinks this is cute? Yay! Who thinks this is cute? I'm not only that, we got nails. Look at the nails. Oh, you got it too. Okay. Who thinks this is cute? I think, I think she needs some tap shoes as well to go back. Oh, you can do the tap. Who thinks this is cute? Great. Well done, girls. Well done. And boys. <laughs> Kids Church is on. Amen. What time is the parade in Cove? Somebody tell me. Is it three? Yeah. I think it's three in Cove. Yeah. Huh? You know, um, just as a, a side note, years ago I used to bring my kids to the parade and used to enjoy it and then a number of years ago when in the parade suddenly there was let's say a certain leaning group displaying themselves and kissing and stuff like that and i said nah i'm not bringing the kids into that anymore do i need to explain it anymore no, do I need? No, no. and i just said no nah, i'm not bringing the kids into this is not what saint patrick's day is about and so forth and so on and i said i'm not bringing the kids into it anymore but I'm thankful that in a lot of local towns and stuff like that, they're doing a lot, they're not just doing it in the big cities anymore, they're doing it in the, in the towns. And in the towns, that's more what's kind of the St. Patrick's Day parade was years ago. You know, you'd have the local butcher with his whatever, and you'd have the local farmer and whatever. You'd have the local thing and the local Cub Scouts and all that kind of crack fashion. it. So I just want to tell you that if you're looking for, you know, to bring your kids to something, to give them a sense of identity, a sense of pride in their community, you know, uh, I would encourage you, those of you in Cove, you know, the Cove Parade is a good one. Uh, you know, just a little family thing. My own grandson will be down there today, you know. So I'm just, I'm just saying, you know, you don't have to go to the big city ones where it's becoming more carnival rather than what we used to have growing up. Becoming a little bit more Mardi Gras, a little bit more that. So, anyway, that's just as a side note. I'm glad to be an Irishman. Uh, I was trying to print off some stuff today for you. Last year, if you might remember, I printed off the Confessions of St. Patrick for you and gave you all a copy of the Confessions of St. Patrick's and the Letter of the Caractus. Uh, how many of you remember that last year? I gave you a copy. Hopefully you have a copy somewhere. And it's just good to have that, to sense you know, our, our foundations where we come from. The fact that we have foundations in, in Ireland that is a very solid and Christian background, our heritage there. And you being in Ireland, and, and a lot of you even have Irish citizenship now, if not all of you. I think and everybody here nearly has Irish citizenship. Don't they? Oh, yourselves don't? Oh, don't you? Well, you have European citizenship. Um, 
I, I keep on getting, Ralph is not here, I keep on saying to Ralph, you're out of Europe now, you need to get Irish citizenship. <laughs> Brexit has kicked you out of Europe. Anyway. <laughs> oh, there he is, there he is. Hey! Welcome! <laughs> now he's wondering, what did he say now? Thank you, Larry. So, you know, I'm glad of, I'm glad of uh, the roots that I have in Ireland because, I don't know about you, are you glad of some of your upbringing, I know there might have been difficulties, but are you glad of some of your upbringing? Is there aspects of your country or where you're from that you were glad of? Yes. Like, um, there's some things maybe not so good, but I'm glad of many good things in Ireland. And some of the good things in Ireland is this, is we do have a Christian heritage that came particularly because of the Celtic Church was so strong was so strong and so Pentecostal. Yes, Pentecostal. Spiritual. And last year I talked to you about that. How even Patrick himself spoke in tongues and got the gift of tongues while he was asleep. It's in his writings. And how the Celtic Church was so strong in many ways. And we, we spent some time on that. But the Celtic Church then went all into Scotland and to Wales and built monasteries all over the place. And then went into all Europe. And it became the land of saints and scholars because of not only in the sense of their saintness, in the sense of going for God and all out for God and wanting God's presence and really wanting God's will, but also scholars because they were educated not only in the scriptures and deeply biblical, but they were also educate themselves in many other aspects. And so Ireland and the monasteries as such in those days became the universities, this founding of universities. And also somewhat held the education system, when Europe was absolutely falling apart, Ireland became that safe haven for Christianity and for education, and then brought that back into Europe, into Germany. For instance, there's a lot of monasteries that were started in Germany by Irish uh, people and, and all over the rest of the part of the world. So sometimes it's interesting to look back at the Celtic history and the Celtic church and to give a sense of where things are at because Tomorrow or the future is looking crazy. I don't know if you realize this, but I'm not just talking in hyperbolic language, but if you're very familiar with what's happening in the politics, political sphere, and if you know what's happening with regards to the economic sphere, at this moment, countries are gathering and silently doing it for the past year. They're gathering gold like crazy. They're doing a lot of other things like crazy, and I don't know if you know this, that maybe if you're aware of some of the countries like NATO and some of the countries in Sweden and stuff like that, and even in Britain, they're gearing up for war. I don't know if you realize that. They're actually gearing up for war. It's something we haven't seen in Europe in a, in a while, but they're actually gearing up for it. Now, things could change. But over the past year, China, Russia, other parts of the world, other parts of Europe have been stocking up gold, stocking up different things, because it, that's the, what you would do in a war situation. You get all the assets solid, whether it's paintings, whether it's stuff like that. Also, I don't know if you're aware of, maybe you are aware, there's another sad thing in the future, is this is, and there's many other things, but there's a sad thing in the future where a lot of people who, let's say for the want of a better word, are of the lower IQ. Before, they might have been able to get a job in a garage or stuff like that, but if they're of the lower IQ, because everything is becoming so technical, that a lot of people are who would normally have gotten a job, whether it was building a road or something like that, now you have to have a degree to, you know, to be building a road, or that there's not going to be much work for them. Another sad statistic coming forward, if you see the trends of times, is that particularly in the Western world, that there's possibly going to be a place where 50% of all women will be single and childless by 2030. 2030. Now these things of coming into the future are pretty rough. And I think about these things. I think about these things because... As a Christian, we're not just called to be me, myself, and I about what I need now. As a prophetic people, we're called to be able to be a light into the world, to be able to speak into situations. 
and to be able to guide people as shepherds, as, as a prophetic people, guide people when this turmoil of the world is the way it is. I say that a little bit about the future because sometimes what needs to be to help us to get through the future that's coming is to dig into our past. What is solid, what is sure, what is foundational. And as we dig into our past, our conservative, you could call it that way, you can call it all different words, but as we dig into what worked in the past, the solid stuff, that's what keeps certain people, certain families, certain nations steady in the storms of when things are gone awry. It's digging into those foundations. And the church also will be constantly digging deeper into the foundations. As Christians, we'll more and more, when things do go a bit of crazy, we'll more and more appreciate family, appreciate that relationships, appreciate Christianity, appreciate the fact that you can have a Bible, appreciate the fact that you can assemble as a worshiping community. Now in Ireland, we haven't had that kind of situation in a long time. Of course, we had the COVID kind of nonsense a little bit about, you know, I don't know if you know now that they actually, you know the six feet rule? I don't know if you know, they actually, it's after coming out now, they just made that up. Anyway, this is a long story. Anyway, I won't get into all of that right now. It's just kind of, it's random because it could be 24 foot. Like, yeah, anyway, it doesn't matter. Just, just the whole, some of the stuff that has come out, you know, and some of our, our curtailing you know people walking on a beach were told you can't walk on a beach because you're 20 miles you shouldn't be traveling 20 miles you know some of this we got to be careful about our freedoms of speech or freedoms that are there that are being curtailed sometimes even in the name of good and sincerity but not realizing what i can do in the long term there will come a time when the christian church will be seen as crazy right-wing nutcases even when you're not necessarily right-wing whatever that means just because you want maybe conservative ideas so what do we do in those situations well we need to go into the scriptures we need to go into their history we need to go in and find out what worked then because often the same principles that work then work today I'm so glad that some of the Celtic church principles and the scriptural principles help us. How many of you have ever heard of St. Patrick's breastplate? Wave up your hand. The others don't see you. Put your hand up. Don't be shy. Put your hand up. St. Patrick's breastplate is a prayer or sometimes made into a song. And Be Down My Vision is a little bit off that song. And, and so is also a song. I don't know if you've ever heard it now. Let me try. Christ be beside me, Christ be before me, Christ be behind me, King of my heart. How many of you ever heard that song? No? Okay. Some of you did. Look it up on YouTube. They sing it. Daniel Daniel sings it. Anyway. It's, it's an old song. It's actually one of my uh, songs that my mentor, my mentor, when I started learning how to play guitar and went to meetings, it was the song he wanted me to sing all the time. All the time. And uh, anyway, I struggled through. But you know, there's some things in our history that are good. And one of the things, for instance, is this prayer, this St. Patrick's breastplate, is not necessarily done by St. Patrick himself. St. Patrick, of course, was, a, you know, in the 432, 30, up to whatever. Some say he went all the way up to, he lived 100 years of age, up to just the 500s. Uh, some people say he died a bit sooner. But anyway, either way, in the 5th century, St. Patrick was here. So in the 5th century he started off, but the Celtic church was so strong, it had a certain element to it. And the prayer of St. Patrick's Breastplate, the first recorded, or the, the closest we can get is about 900 years. You know, 900 years, uh, so that's about, what's that, that's about 400 years, 300 years after, after not after Christ, after St. Patrick. About 300 years later, that's the closest we can get. But the Celtic church was so strong, it was strong all the way up to about the 1100s before it really got filtered in with more European and Roman church. But so the Celtic church was very strong. So this prayer that we can go back to in the ninth century is an interesting prayer because it shows us a little bit of the Celtic sense of how to do Christianity, how to live it out, how to actually apply it. Now, 
I was hoping to be able to print off the whole lot for you, but my printer, I tried it again, my printer is just not working. But I do want to give you a part of that prayer. A part of that prayer, it starts off with we bind onto ourselves the Trinity and talks about even casting out uh, devils. It talks about how to protect yourself from the curses of, of false wizards and stuff like that. It, it talks all of those areas. The Celtic church the, was a biblical, Pentecostal, spirit-filled church completely. And there's one part in that prayer that it says this. Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me. Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right hand, Christ on my left, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down, Christ in the heart of every man who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of every man who speaks of me, Christ in the eye that sees me, Christ in the ear that hears me. I want you to think about that. That's just one aspect of that prayer. And I want you to notice how much it was very much like Christ absolutely around me in every sphere of my life. The presence of Christ in my life. Not only the presence of Christ, the acknowledgement of the presence of Christ by others who see me and hear me. A complete sense of the presence of God, the presence of Jesus Christ, the King of Kings. If there's anything we need during times of craziness in our families, during times of craziness in our workplace, during times of upheaval in our health or anything else, and also coming into the future where there's any difficulties, whether it is war situations, economic situations, moral decay, Whatever comes into our situations as the church comes under pressure, there's one thing for sure that the Celtic church had, and I dare say the Old Testament and the New Testament, one thing for sure, not just intellectually, but in a great deep awareness, is the sense of God's presence, real presence. Not a theology about it, not just an intellectual, yes, that's what the Bible says, but a real sense of God's presence, of the presence of Christ. Would you turn with me please to Exodus, Exodus chapter 33. Those of you on Facebook, welcome today. We thankfully have gotten our Facebook sorted out. YouTube was going all the time. We got our Facebook sorted out, particularly we were missing some uh, functionality, some cables and stuff. And we're just blessed by Hannah sort sorted that out for us. And, and now she's nodding her head because she's embarrassed, but thank you, Hannah, for getting that sorted out. So if you've got your Bible, please uh, turn to Exodus, as I said, chapter 33. Are you there? Okay, in Exodus 33, where we're going to start off is in verse 7. Oh, no, sorry, we're going to even start off sooner than that. I want to go up to verse 3. Now, as we give the context... This is, you know, Moses went up the mountain and so forth, got the Ten Commandments, but down below, they were all worshipping the golden calf and stuff like that. Moses came down the hill and said, oh my goodness, and God said, no, oh my goodness, and so forth and so on. This is the context, and yet at the same time, God is still wanting to help them, but different ways. So look at verse 3 of Exodus 33. It says, go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you. Because you are stiff-necked people, and I might destroy you on the way. <laughs> so here, God is saying to him, look, I promised I'd get you to the promised land. Go ahead. But look, I can't go with you because, guys, I'm going to... It, it's not going to work. You know, I'm going to fulfill what I said I would do, but I can't go with you. If my holy presence is with you, then you're going to be messed up. Now I want you to go on from there. Verse 4. When the people heard these distressing words, they began to mourn, and no one put on ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, Tell the Israelites, you are a stiff-necked people. If I were to go with you, even for a moment, I might destroy you. So again, this warning, because the people were stiff-necked, doing their own thing, not yielding to God and not staying yielded to God but kept on doing their own thing the presence of God could not be with them 
Now, I want to go to verse 7. Now Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people arose and stood at the entrance of their tents, watching Moses until he entered the tent. Verse 9. As Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance, while the Lord spoke with Moses. Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, they all stood and worshipped each at the entrance to their tent. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but young, young A. Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. So here we see in the midst of before they go on their travels that Moses is still practicing meeting with God face to face in the tent of meeting, the presence of God. This wasn't a theory. This wasn't a theology on its own. This was not just a nice thing to say. This was a living reality and practice in Moses' life. Where he would meet with God daily. As much as possible, constant. Now there was some issues. He had to go to the tent of meeting. Outside the camp, away from the people a little bit. Outside the camp. And God had said, I'm not going to go. When you leave, when you start heading towards the promised land, I'm not going to be with you. So that tent, that would be a problem then. Because God wouldn't continue on. The pillar of fire and the pillar of smoke wouldn't be going with them. But Moses would meet with God and a reality is not just some kind of meet with God in some kind of intellectual way. No, he met with God and spoke with him face to face as one would speak to a friend. The deepest sense of what prayer is. The deepest sense of what prayer is is not all the religious you know, stuff that we may or may not do. That can be helpful in its own way, the liturgical, because we otherwise are sometimes too dependent on emotions when I feel like it. So sometimes it's good to have set prayers and set things to help you because we are sometimes, as I said, too led by emotion. So sometimes it's good to have a practice, a habit that is good. But on the other side, you can have practices and habits that are not getting to the essence of what it's about. Speaking to God in a very close way as one would speak to a friend. We also know from scriptures here that also when Moses would leave the tent of meeting, that he would be glowing. And so glowing that people would recognize that and be amazed at that. And because Moses didn't want people to be looking at him as something special, he would put a veil over himself. The veil was not to, in one sense, hide God's glory. It was just because the people had a tendency to anything that moved of goodness other than God, they had a tendency to worship that. It's good to have respect for your leaders is another thing having a worshipful sense. Only God is to be worshipped. Can I have an amen? amen? And also with that, what Moses had, technically speaking, was available to every single one in the audience, as they say. Hence, Joshua, son of Nun, recognized that. And that's why he would hang on. Because he recognized what is good for Moses and God. It's possible. It's possible. I can have the same. And he hungered for it and he sought for it. Of course, later on, we know that Joshua became the leader of the people. Would you turn with me down to verse uh, 14 of that? I want to, sorry, sorry, start in verse 12, sorry. Verse 12. Moses said to the Lord, you have been telling me, lead these people. So this is one of the kind of conversations. This is the essence, essence of it. You've been telling me to lead these people. But you have not let me know whom you will send with me. In other words, okay, you're not going to go. Who's going to come with me? You said, I know you by name and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so I know you and continue to find favor with you. Wow. Remember that this nation is your people. In other words, this is your problem. These are prayers. These are very... Honest heart-to-heart -heart prayers. He's not trying to be disrespectful. He's having a, you know, he's having, this is prayer. You know, one of the things you need to do when you're in trouble, whether it's emotionally or whatever, 
You need to just be honest with God. He can handle it. Rather than you being silent, giving God the silent treatment. Don't give God the silent treatment. Talk to him. Even if he means that you're you know, emotionally all over the place, talk to him. Then verse 14, the Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send me up from here. Verse 16, how will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. Then Moses said, now show me your glory. Now, why I want to bring this out is this, is that Moses recognized that the only major thing, a rooted thing, in the face of their own problems, in the face of their future, their impending future of continuing through desert land, of continuing to come to a place where they have to fight for the promise. Because goodness does not come without cost. You have to fight for it. And as they're going towards and fighting for their families and fighting for their nation and fighting for the things of God, as they're going forward, one thing Moses recognized, it doesn't matter whether we have the Jewish flag or the, you know, the horns blowing, it doesn't matter what we have, it doesn't matter if we're organized really well, which they were already, it doesn't matter, any of that does not matter unless your presence is really with us. That it's real. It's not just a teaching. It's not just a theology. It's a real sense of your presence and that you are with us and that we are with you. Because otherwise, the world will eat us up, basically, Moses is saying. We're no different than anyone else. And we're relying on man's strength and man's power. And man's, and we're going to be eaten up. We're going to be swallowed up because we're also faltering like anybody else. We need your presence. Moses is pleading for the grace of God, the mercy of God, not the justice of God. Because the justice of God is, you've sinned, the death, departing from God's presence. Death is separation. And so because of their sin, they were separated. But he pleaded for the presence of God. And then what we do, we see. We see even from the Garden of Eden, the main thing about the Garden of Eden is not the beautiful trees. It's not the fruit. It's not the river. It's not any of that. It's not even the good relationship between Adam and Eve that was there at the beginning. The main thing in the Garden of Eden was the very presence of God, that you could walk and talk with him. That is the core Moses recognizes that, the different people recognize that, that all these other things, good that they may be, will falter, will fall. They're not really the main thing. The main thing, the one thing, is to be in the presence of God, to know him and talk with him and have a sense of him wherever you're going or yield it to him that we would... Hopefully by God's grace, not have a stiff neck, but yield to him as the good shepherd who knows how to lead us not only into the heights, but through the valleys. Even the valleys of the shadow of death, where they're difficult. There was Martha and Mary. Do you remember Martha and Mary? You're very familiar with the story of Martha and Mary. Martha doing everything and everything and everything, but Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus said, that one thing will not be taken from her. The one thing, to know that Christ is with you, Christ is in you, Christ is beside you, Christ is above you, Christ is beneath you, Christ is in the hearts of those who think of you, in the ears of those who hear you, in the eyes of those who see you, to have the sense of Christ in every part of your being and life, to know that God is with you and that you are with him. Because this life is soon to pass and only things of Christ will last. I say that again and again. Not only does it rhyme well, it's the truth. How many of you face different things in your life at times? Those of you who are older and the older you get, you know, suddenly there's a health issue. Suddenly there's a financial issue. Suddenly there's an emotional issue. Either with your wife, your spouse, your husband, your kids. Life is stormy and it's not going to get any less stormy but with christ i can learn how to walk on the water with christ i can learn how to 
gauge the storm and sometimes even tell the storm to be calm. But whether or which, whether I'm in the fire or whether I'm in the dungeon, whether I'm in the storm or wherever I am or in the valley, that if I have Christ with me and I'm with Christ, I can overcome. In Christ, I can do all things. I can face all circumstances if I know Christ is with me. This is what the Celtic church had. This is what the early church had. These are the rooted things that help us to bear fruited things. These are the roots by which we need to constantly have, even as Christians, because as Christians, we can go to church sometimes and we can forget that if God is not with us, it doesn't matter if I sing happy clappy. I gotta have a sense of God's with me. Now, again, I'm not talking about an emotional sense. I'm saying just that aspect that God is with me in the midst of even difficulties. Whether I'm in the storm or in the prison, wherever I am, Christ with me. Can I have an amen? amen? These are the things that will help us. Not only are the roots from our past, but it's for our present and for our future. These are the things, these are the rooted things that help us to get through stuff by which we can create somewhat of Eden, even in the midst of of a broken world but it is God's presence to walk and talk with him God said yes I'm going to walk and talk with you as Moses said look we need you we can't do anything without you in fact if you don't go with us we can't go we, we need you what will distinguish us from any other people we, we need you how will people know that we're really you and blessed of you Moses then thankfully was given, uh, he already had instructions, but he was given and, and they walked with the tent of meeting. The tent of meeting followed them all the way through as they walked towards the promised land. And that presence of God was that the main factor as all the tents and everything was geared around the presence of God. Not only did Moses have the tent of meeting, but after that it became the tabernacle mm -hmm. by which the whole community had a tent of meeting. By which they could come to God's presence. Now there were certain ways that it was built in a specific way. Specific sacrifices in specific ways. So they could come into the presence of God. And not be killed but be blessed. Because the presence of God. The fire of God. The very presence of God. The burning bush of God as such. That fire of God. That pillar of fire. That pillar of smoke. For you it can be a blessing or it can be a judgment. His very presence is the very place of blessing or judgment. For one, the fire will burn them. For another, the fire will warm them. So the presence of God was going. And the only way the presence of God could go with the Israelites, and many people don't realize this, it was not just the laws, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. The way that the presence of God could go with them is because they understood the grace of given through sacrifice the sacrifices of the blood lambs the sacrifices and the offerings that in other words helped to get rid of their sins so that the presence of God could come with them without killing them then we come into the New Testament and it's true the Old Testament as well and other parts as well but we come into the New Testament of course in the Old Testament we see the tent of meeting or, and then the tabernacle and then we see Solomon and David as such and Solomon building a physical temple in the nation of Israel where it's not just moving now it's actually in Jerusalem it's the, the presence of God and so anytime the people were around the presence of God of course it was blessed anytime when they weren't following God weren't taking a hold of the grace offered to them that the temple was often then destroyed and they were sent into exile it's the presence of God that will make the Israeli of God be the blessing of God into all the nations. It's the presence of God that creates the Eden of God, the Garden of Eden. It's the presence of God that will bring fruit into your life. Do you know that the temple, when it was made, not only the tent of meeting, but also the tabernacle and also the physical temple, do you know that it was displayed with all kind of fruit and different stuff and flowers and palm trees and stuff? That the menorah, you know the menorah that we had, the seven candlestick, the menorah, that's depicting an olive tree with branches and coming out. That was depicting the Garden of Eden. That's what the temple was, is to depict the Garden of Eden where the presence of God is. And so likewise, that sense is all the way through the Old Testament. 
And then we come into the New Testament, of course, we come to Jesus. We come to Jesus who is the Emmanuel, God with us. You're familiar with the scriptures, of course, in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, and also in Matthew, where it talks about God with us. Jesus is the Emmanuel. Because up to that time, again, it was careful that the presence of God was at one stage at different people, at a measure at the, te at the tent of meeting, and at a measure at the tabernacle, at a measure in the temple itself, at a measure sometimes on a prophet who was been praying and fasting. But it was still very measured. Because even though God's presence did go with them, if the fullness of God's glory came, if the fullness of God's presence came, it would kill them. In fact, later on in Exodus 33, we see Moses says, show me your glory. And then we see where Moses is, is put us safely away and God would pass, his goodness would pass, and he'd call out his name, but not all of him would be shown because it would kill him. He could not see him face to face. In that sense, there's, there's certain measures of the presence of God. Now, theologically, you know that God is everywhere, omnipresent. Isn't that true? Yeah. But I could be present here, and then I could be present here. Hopefully, all of you are actually present here, and you're not actually now sitting there and thinking about shopping or thinking about the Patrick's Parade or thinking about the dinner that's boiling right now on the stove. You know, hopefully, and those of you actually on Facebook and YouTube, uh, hopefully you're present, that you're not just, you know, doing something right now, that you're actually listening and present because don't think it's like, you know, I've done church, I've gone to church, I've listened on Facebook, I've listened on YouTube, I've done my religious duty. Stop. Stop. It's about being present. And letting God be present with you. Amen? Amen? So we see there's measures of presence. God is everywhere. But there's measures of presence. We see in Genesis, we see, of course, the presence of God walking with them in the cool of the day, face to face. And of course, Adam and Eve trying to hide. And then they somewhat could come back into the presence of God as God put in garments upon them. But then they were out of the garden and God was still speaking to them. But if you're reading in Genesis, it says later, later, later on, it says, and now is the time when people called on the name of the Lord. In other words, the Lord's presence was not just coming naturally. They had to call on him to become you with me? And, and then, so there's that aspect of the, the presence of God, the presence of God, the presence of God. There's aspects, there's levels of the presence of God. There's levels of the anointing, the, the presence of his anointing power. There's walking in the water ankle deep. There's walking in the water knee deep. There's walking in the water waist deep. There's submersion in the water. Jesus was Emmanuel, God with us, a fully human being, fully human. And yet at the same time, even though fully human, he carried the full presence of God, the full presence of the Father. He was Emmanuel. And because of that, as Jesus walked around, he was fully flowing as the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit together, He's fully flowing as the divine one, but also human. In fact, I would like you to turn to another scripture, if you wouldn't mind, because I want you to see something here. Would you turn with me, please, to John's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 34. It's just a little phrase, but you might be aware of the depth of what this phrase was meaning. John 3, 34. John's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 34 says this. For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For God gives the spirit without limit. Or some of your versions might say, God gives the spirit without measure. There's another version that says that God gives the spirit not only without measure, but he doesn't give it sparingly. That's the New American Standard Bible. On Jesus... There was no limitation. See, there was limitation with Moses. There was limitations with all this. There was limitations ever since Adam and Eve had to come out of the presence of God from the Garden of Eden. There was limitations. Even all the prophets, even all the Moses, all of them, David, all of them. There was limitations. But not with Jesus. There was no limitation. 
he could walk with the Father and the Holy Spirit whilst on earth in fullness. Because there was no sin in him. There was nothing to separate. There was no death. There was nothing to separate him from the Father. Are you with me? That's why even later on you'll see in scriptures it talks about not only in John's gospel but it also talks about in Matthew's gospel how Jesus talked about see this temple you you bust up this temple in three days it will be raised again. He's talking about himself. That he was basically declaring in John's gospel and in Matthew's gospel I now am the tent of meeting. In fact that's what the scripture says. He came the word made flesh and dwelt among us. That dwelling, that tent the tent of meeting. Jesus becomes the very presence of God in the earth. The tent of meeting. I am the temple. I am the presence of God. So he was somewhat taking away the physical temple and taking away the tent of meeting and all. I'm the very temple of God. I'm the meeting place. No one can come to the Father but through me. I'm the very meeting place. Even though I'm fully human, I'm fully carrying without limit the very presence of God. With that, when the worship was right, when the faith was right, the presence of God could come out and the kingdom of God could come out and establish miracles and establish the kingdom of God on the earth. Even Jesus though, though he's Emmanuel, even Jesus didn't perform any miracles or didn't go into ministry until after his baptism. He's told his submission to the will of God, the Father, about his death and resurrection. And after his baptism, the Holy Spirit came upon him as a dove. John the Baptist has said, the one coming after me will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And John the Baptist was more thinking in a sense of judgment at that stage. And it was afterwards he started to see, oh, there's more to this. There goes the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And the presence of the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus. And he moved and he, he fasted for 40 days and he came out of the desert, not only with the presence of God, not only in the, Father, in the sense of the Holy Spirit, but he came out in power. You see, what will make the distinguishing mark? I'm glad I'm Pentecostal. I don't know. God bless, God bless those people, whether they're Baptist or whoever. Not all Baptists are that way, but God bless them. God bless the, some of the traditionalists who, whether it's Presbyterian or whatever, and they say the gifts of the Spirit are God. God bless them. God bless them. Now, what do you mean then? You're going to just move by human strength. I'm so glad I'm Pentecostal. I'm so glad I'm charismatic. I'm so glad. Now, sometimes there's some stuff out there that's just flaky, flaky, flaky. I'm sad about that, the flakiness. But at the same time, I'd rather some ha have some hot sauce than no hot sauce, if you get what I'm saying. I'd rather have something that makes a difference. I'm glad that I came to the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit set me free. I'm glad of the power of God, the presence of God. I don't, I'm in an intellectual, but I don't want just an intellectual gospel. I want the, the good news of God's presence, of God's power, of God's kingdom that's real. And Jesus said, this is the good news, that the kingdom of God is not just something coming. The kingdom of God is now here at hand. And the essence of the kingdom of God is God's very presence. Jesus kept on saying things like this. It's good that I go away, because if I go away, then the Holy Spirit will come to you. Because, yes, it's good. This is a higher place than ever before. We had the tent, of, the, the tent of meeting, and then we had the tabernacle, and then we had the temple. And now you have me here, Jesus speaking. You have me here, and because of that, there's miracles in the kingdom of God. That's a good thing. But it's even better if I go away, die, rise again. It's even better so that you can become the temple of God. That you can receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And dare I say this, in the name of Jesus... Don't be fooled by people, honestly, some Pentecostals solemnly. Don't be fooled by people saying, come up forward and you'll get a double anointing. Oh, that drives me nuts. You know why? You know why? Because they're stopping you from having faith in what is really there for you. To be sure of and to be certain of this. That in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, Yeshua Emmanuel, in the name of Jesus, Yeshua Mashiach, the one who died and rose again. 
You can, in the name of Jesus, receive the Holy Spirit without limit. Come on, I don't know about you, and that's exciting to know. It's not just a small portion, a half a portion, a double a portion. Come to me and you'll get seven portions and pay a tithe on the way. No, it's not that. In the name of Jesus, it's open to you. The gospel is open to you where you can receive the full anointing and the full portion of God by which you become a temple of the very presence of God without limit. That's a possibility for you. Amen. Yes. Amen. I didn't say it's a guarantee for you because you have to... You have to dance with God. You have to participate. But it's a possibility for you. In fact, Paul says one of the problems in the Pentecostal charismatic Corinthian church, they had lots of things going for them. But one of the things that they hadn't gone for them is because aspects of overcoming and victory over sin and other stuff. And he says this, the reason being, the reason being is this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, 14, something like that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it says, you don't know that you know. You don't know that you know. You don't know that you're temples of the Holy Spirit. Intellectually, you might know it, but you're not living in the good of it. That you are carrying the very presence of God. And Paul gets very clear about that. You shouldn't be carrying the presence of God into a brothel. That's, well, not into a brothel. Then he didn't mind that. I mean, you know, I don't need to explain it any more than that. And the reason why you're finding stuff and doing stuff is because you don't know that you are full of the presence of God. You see, our minds can be cluttered. Our hearts can be cluttered. And we can be going around in our life, and even some degree, and I understand when we say, God, come, and Holy Spirit, come. Even the early church did it, even in the book of Acts did it. I understand that language, and sometimes we have to use that language. But one of the things we have to do is step into a place of faith. Oh, not just faith for a nice Mercedes. Not just faith for that. And just as Sam was saying, we, we have faith. We, Sam is out of work now the past, whatever, three months. And so we, we absolutely live by faith. We've done it for years. We're still doing it. We have no problem. But faith for those things are good. Faith for those things are good. But really what faith is about is being sure of and being certain about who God is. His character. His goodness towards you. That God is the God who rewards those who seek him and believe in him. Have faith in this, that what Jesus has done is a finished work and you can come into the very fire presence of God and not be burnt up. But instead, let the presence of God ooze all over you. Let the presence of God ooze out of you. That's what we need today. That's what we needed yesterday. That's what we need today. And that's what we need into the future. Because this world is going to be topsy-turvy. But those who are in Christ, with Christ, true Christ, those who have a sense of Christ above them, uh, beneath them, beside them, those who have a sense that Christ will go forward by his spirit into the hearts of those who think of them, into the ears of those who hear them, into the eyes of those who see them, those who have a sense of God's presence, that they are a burning bush on fire with the presence of God, they will be the ones that will stand even when everything else is faltering. Can I say an amen to that? Amen. You're still too weak for me. Can I have an amen for that? Amen. I want to hear a flood of amen. amen. It is what it is. It's true. And that's why when we sing the songs of Christ be with me, Christ be beside me, I pray we recognize that presence. Because that's what the Celtic church had. The Celtic church was scholars. The Celtic church were people dedicated to God. But the Celtic church was fully Pentecostal. They were baptized, immersed in, submerged in, yielded to the very presence of the Holy Spirit. We as Pentecostals, we as Charismatics, we as just simply as Christians need to recognize the presence of God amongst us. To be aware that when I walk into the room, God's presence is here because he's flooding out of us. Now, if you see it, and if you see it, and if you see it, give a guess what happens. The more you acknowledge that you're a temple carrying the presence of God, just that awareness helps the Holy Spirit to be able to flow. Just that awareness. Because if you're coming in, oh God, help. You're in a, a place of not believing. You're in a place of struggling. You're in a place of, now, if that's where you're at, that's where you're at. But we need to get you to a place of faith. Amen. You need to come to a place of faith. God's presence is with me. Not because of anything good I've done, but because of the work of Jesus. Because of what Jesus has done. Is this helping anybody here? Yes. 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 Good, I'm 
glad it's helping a few. It only takes three. It really does. It only takes three. What is revival? Revival is coming back into that sense of God being able to flow in his presence. To such a degree that even the unbelievers, the unbelievers are struck by the sense of the presence of God. Because the light is greater than the darkness. The presence of God is greater than any presence of evil. May we absolutely submerge ourselves in the knowledge that we are filled with the Holy Spirit. And that with that, when you're acknowledged he's with you, it will help you to move and yield according to his will. How do you overcome the darkness? Turn on the light. Greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. Greater than any sickness and disease. Greater than any problems you face. May we absolutely immerse ourselves in this acknowledgement and the reality that if you're a Christian right now, you are saved, you are bought by the blood of Jesus, and the presence of God is in you. How many of you here have been baptized in the water? Wave up me, put your hand up. You might not feel it. You might not always see it. But as the song goes, God is working. God is working. You need to stay in that place so that God can be more free to work. God is working. Right now, you have maybe family members who you're worried about. You have school people. You have college people. You have workplaces. Right now, recognize God is with me and also Christ goes before. Working on hearts of people about me. He's going before me in that interview. He's going before me in that relationship situation. He's going before me. Acknowledge his presence right now. Those of you on Facebook and YouTube, God's presence is with you. Right now, just acknowledge his presence. Would you say with me? Simple thing. You ready? I've given my life to God. I believe in Jesus. Through his blood, as it says in Hebrews, I may come into the presence of God without shame, without guilt. Not because of anything good I've done, but because of the good he has done. The blood of Jesus it's powerful. It's, powerful. It's, more powerful it's more powerful than my sin, than my sin. or my guilt conscience. Or my guilt conscience. And, by and by the blood of Jesus, I come into the presence of God I and I say thank you. Thank, you. thank you. Not only do I come before the throne of heaven and the, of God, and the presence of God in heaven through the name of Jesus, name of Jesus. but right now as I'm on earth, right now, I'm on earth. in the name of Jesus, through the, work of Jesus, Through the work of Jesus, I welcome, I welcome the presence of the Holy Spirit, the of the Holy Spirit to fill me afresh, to, fill me afresh, to baptize me anew, to, baptize to immerse me, to immerse me in, his in his presence. I believe, I believe that not only can I enter heaven I in the name of Jesus, name but heaven, heaven can come to earth. Come to earth. The kingdom of God is now at hand. Lord God, move in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Father God, on the night your son was betrayed, as you looked upon him, you saw the sacrifice he was going to do, and it pained you. Lord Jesus, on the night you were going to be betrayed, when you took that bread, you saw the sacrifice you would do, and it did pain you. But I thank you, Holy Spirit, that in the leading of that, that at the same time in the pain, that you gave the Father and you gave the Son great joy. Great joy because people would be cleansed, people would be redeemed, and your presence could once again deeply deeply walk and talk with man again. That your presence 
could once again fill in the name of Jesus to fill even without limit. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you became broken, that we would be made whole. You've given us so many good things. But when you broke this bread, you said, this is my body, broken for you. Lord Jesus, I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful for all that you've done. And Lord Jesus, on the night you were betrayed, you also took the cup. And you said, this is the cup of the new covenant for the forgiveness of our sins. You poured out, literally, you poured out your spirit. Fully human, yet fully divine, you poured out your spirit, perfect spirit, that we would be made whole and we would be forgiven. So Lord God, we thank you for this cup. We thank you for this new covenant cup by which we are forgiven of our sins. And as we eat of the bread and we drink of the cup, Lord, may we have a sense of communion with your very presence, spirit, soul, and body. May we recognize, Lord Jesus, that you want to be in us, through us, and with us. That you are the vine and we are the branches and that we are totally dependent upon your movement in our being. Yes. And in your name, Lord Jesus, as we commune with you, in your name we can come to the Father and the Holy Spirit. Lord, may we not only accept this grace, may we also move into a place of deep foundational love with the Father. And a deep sense of fellowship and friendship with the Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord, to grow in faith, to know, to experience, to live in the acknowledgement that your presence is with us and we are temples and we carry treasures in jars of clay. This is our distinguishing mark. This is what makes us different. In Jesus' name, please come forward and partake, as always, take a piece of bread. Please go back to your seat.
thank you for your goodness. And on this St. Patrick's Day, and on every Sunday, we, may we not forget our foundations. We, may we not forget what we're doing it and why we're doing it. To be close with you. To have your closeness with us. May we not forget why we meet together. So that together we can acknowledge not only as an individual but also as a body that we are your temple. And each living stone has its place. So Lord, as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup today, may we more than ever acknowledge that you are with us, in us, through us. In Jesus' name. The church said, Amen. Amen.
Facebook and YouTube, it's a blessing to have you with us. Right now, right here, would you just touch the neighbor beside you and say, hey, I hope you know, God's presence is with you. Nothing can stand against you as you walk with him. Amen? Amen. 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 Be blessed and be a blessing. God bless you. God bless you.